My name is Kevin Alceri from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and I work on the ImageJ project. This is the pre-processing part of our bioimage analysis. And in this section of the, uh, of the video series, we're going to be talking about the importance of understanding where your data came from. Image analysis has the goal to do measurements and further analysis, but you can't blindly just take your data as it comes in. You really need to understand where your data came from and what were the constraints of the acquisition, whether it's limitations of the system or even mistakes that may have been made as part of the acquisition. And it's really important to understand these constraints. And this could be anywhere from parameters you want to collect, such as a really big field of view where you want to stitch and bring your data together in big fields of view and understanding what are the constraints and uh, necessary options for stitching, to issues like your microscope may not always be properly uniformly illuminated, understanding issues of illumination correction and understanding how your sample is lighted up. Also registration, you may have different views, different cameras where you want to bring them in and correlate them. Or modalities such as light sheet microscopy, where you look at different perspectives, you want to be able to understand how to stitch and register those together. But the number one thing is always keep in mind that you need good data in, good data out. The importance is that you don't use the analysis to correct for failures in acquisition. You want the best data set possible before you analyze. And the big goal of that is to actually have the best signal to noise. If you want to find a signal of object of interest, such as later talks where we talk about segmentation, you want to make sure that you have good signal to noise, which means good data. And so we're going to start in this series about more basic methods and then move to the more advanced. So one of the most common things you might do is cropping, where you want to actually crop a field of view and actually see, kind of get rid of the unnecessary background, the, the elements that might be confusing, distracting to the eye, but also distracting to the algorithm. So it's a simple concept. You might want to remove the edges of a culture disk, or as I showed here, just the unnecessary black background, reducing the non-information areas. And it's very common when you do this for colocalization, as we talk about in other videos, where you just want to see how two things of interest colocalize or in the same place. And so having less background can help in that, because otherwise more background could influence certain calculations such as colocalization. And so sometimes you need to reduce the areas without the signal just because it's confusing to the scientist. Another thing you may want to do to make it easy for the algorithm is just invert your sample. So again, a very simple concept is illustrated here, where you just want to actually invert it. Maybe the algorithm prefers to have something white objects on black. You can very easily invert it. And it's very important to always do this in the context of knowing what is your pixel values, what is your bit depth, what is your sample's parameters, and really knowing what you're doing to your data, keeping the original data when you make these kind of changes. Uh, sometimes you also just want to improve the noise or smooth the edges of objects. Filtering is an incredibly powerful way to better, uh, have better contrast to differentiate your objects. And there are many classic filters, such as median filtering, getting rid of noise, or Gaussian filtering, where you get rid of background distraction. And these filters can often be used together, and they can be chained into series to get the optimal contrast for your particular case. And they're available in many tools, such as ImageJ. And there are more specifics in filtering and other videos in our series. As well, many times you actually want to do color metric analysis. For example, one of the gold standards in all clinical care is pathology, where you use dyes and stains. And for example, as illustrated here, you would actually have stains such as hematoxylin in blue and eosin in magenta. You have these color metric stains that can tell apart a tumor from a non-tumor, but you want to unmix them and be able to extract these colors. So both Cell Profiler and MSJ have very easy to use tools for extracting these colors for further analysis. As well, a very common thing is just to have better views. We live in a world of 3D, but when we analyze data, we actually want to understand the 3D aspects. And with these 3D objects, we want to go back and forth. We have easy ways of showing them on the screen, on video online, but even in print. And Z projections are one powerful way of condensing your data using projections. And the classic is a maximum intensity production, which is really great for showing what's going on in your data set in a condensed form that might help you, as shown here, where I can actually condense all this data into this image here, and then I can analyze that data, for example, for segmentation. And it's a very powerful way of being able to see what is happening in this case if I just want to understand the objects. Or if I want to do intensity, I may want to sum all the signal as shown here. And so the power of different views as is in Z projections is very important. As well, you may want to have a three-dimensional view of your data set. So as shown on this screen, you have data where you really want to look slice by slice, and yet you want to have it three-dimensional. You don't want to be constricted to just a projection view. You want to see the full 3D rendering. 
And so this is something that you can do uh, in a tool called SciView, for example, in MSJ, where you can actually understand the 3D rendering. And Loic Royer, our colleague in another video, will be talking about 3D rendering in depth. And I encourage you to uh, look at that. Uh, another issue, as I mentioned early on, is understand the limitations of your system. Ideally, you want to understand your acquisition so you can fix it when you acquire it. And a classic example is the bulb on a microscope being not set up and aligned correctly. But there may be times where you can't deal with it. Uh, it's already been acquired, or it's uh, not your microscope, or other issues of the uh, illumination correction. And this image here shows us that on the far uh, image here, you are seeing issues of the uh, uneven light. We've actually, in panel B, have shown it in more clarity. And we can actually correct that through uh, uh, post-processing, so that or pre-processing, so that we can actually correct that frame. Another important thing for tracking a segmentation as uh, my colleague Ann Carpenter will talk about in our, one of our other videos, is the importance of increasing the SNR. And this is the idea of trying to understand our resolving capability and being able to detect objects from each other. So as shown in this frame here, we actually want to be able to clearly make out each element, each cell, and be able to tell one from the other. And so there are some very nice pre-processing techniques you can do to increase that and isolate those signals so then you can do uh, uh, decrease the noise and increase the signal so that you can do things like single processing uh, and segmentation and so on on those images. What happens if you have to align two more images of the same scene? For example, if you have uh, sets of cells and they're migrating and you want to actually see from different microscopes or different cameras what is going on in that scene. This is a process we call registration. And it's the idea of transforming different sets of image data into one coordinate system. And the concept is very simple. You calculate a transformation function which is essentially the math for modifying the space relationship uh, to, between pixels. And the idea of having an input range where you transform against a reference image. And then that transformation function takes into account the geometric distortions, angle, orientation, shifting, and distance, as you can see in this uh, pipeline here on the screen. And the thing to keep in mind is there can be many sources for why you might want to register and deal with issues of air. For example, when you're sectioning tissue, your knife blade may uh, miss a cut. You may actually miss a section, and you may have to register when it's harder to see between different views, even though it's the same sample. Or in the case of light sheet, where you actually have different views and you want to correlate them. So registration is a very important concept. And as I mentioned, you know, this general technique can be used in many ways. Uh, not only in light sheet and dealing with different views, but also if you want bigger fields of view, such as you want to actually analyze uh, many different positions and stitch them together. And you can do this fairly automatically. You can actually have points and features shared between the images, and you can do it manually by hunting and pecking and finding these, or you can use algorithms that can find them automatically. So for example, in image J, we have the ability to computationally find, as you see here in yellow, corresponding points and features in the images and use these to actually determine the best transformation function. So it can do it for you to register these images, which is incredibly useful, particularly for large data sets. And a very famous example is shown in this uh, plugin from ImageJ called Unwarp. You can actually use a type of elastic algorithm to actually correct for deformations in the image and still register them, as you see here in the Eiffel Tower uh, image that has been corrected and registered. And this is an example of the registering of sequence images I talked about. And uh, uh, there's, in general, the, also the idea that not only the registration for a single field of view, but what if I wanted a giant field of view? So a good example is if you went to the Grand Canyon and wanted to take a picture of the Grand Canyon, your favorite smartphone is capable of actually automatically taking bunches of photos and stitching them together. And we want to do the same thing in imaging. We want to actually have a high resolution view, maybe part of the Grand Canyon, but then, like Google Maps, be able to zoom out and see the entire thing. And so you can do that in microscopy too, where a single picture can't capture it all, so we take many pictures, and then we can automatically stitch that together. And that's a common uh, application of registration and stitching. And so motorized stages allow you to do this, where you can roam around, and you can actually have coordinates so that the stage can be kept track of all the coordinates, and you can computationally stitch all these coordinates together with the help of algorithms. And these stitching tools have gotten quite powerful, where you can do it from a whole bunch of samples or less samples, and it can actually uh, use the registration to deal with issues of overlap and lack of overlap and getting the best result based on whatever data you acquired from your microscope. And uh, this is uh, an example of what you can do here. You can see uh, all the images that we've stitched together and the final results. And as you can see here, you may often need to correct for the brightness difference at the borders 
using correction uh, techniques uh, that we very mentioned very briefly so that you get the best result and the smoothest results so you don't see the little squares and the artifacts, as you can see in particular in the uh, first, uh, the middle one there. Another really important aspect of preprocessing is deconvolution, understanding the noise and air in your system. When you acquire fluorescent images in particular, these are very digital views of your actual sample, and you have to understand the limitations in the air of your actual microscope and the defining optics. And it's important to understand the convolution of air that can be introduced in your acquired images by the fundamental hardware on your system. And we often call this the optical blurring, and you can say the image is convoluted. Deconvolution is trying to correct that systematic error. This is due to the hardware on your scope to get rid of that blur. And this can be very important because it can often result in why your microscope may look more noisy or have less contrast than a colleague's microscope that seems to have similar capabilities. You want to be able to see smaller features, for example, and that can be prevented by problems due to convolution or noise introduction. And so what you can do uh, in this kind of work is understanding, for example, a basic bead and trying to understand what is the actual object trying to measure and trying to measure what's called a point spread function, basically this mathematical measurement of what is your point spread of your sample, understanding in Z what is the air produced by air of your optics, your actual glass, uh, issues like optical oil or things being left on that might contaminate your view. And we can correct for that. We can understand this mathematical function and then use other algorithms together with the point spread function to correct for the inherent convolution of your system. So think of it as a way for correcting of the air of your optics. And we can correct the raw image before we ever get to additional post-processing as we talk about in this video series. So the importance of deconvolution can be used on fluorescence, confocal microscopy, and other, and other types of data to get the best possible quality data. And so with that, we're going to end this part of the series. But thank you for your attention. And I hope you get a chance to watch the other videos in our image analysis series.